Okay, let's talk about what makes a great federal capture manager. Um, in the federal market, sales is basically broken down into three categories, three phases, or overlapping phases, if you will. There's business development, there's capture management, and there's proposal management. So basically, BD is finding an opportunity, capture is about pursuing an opportunity, and proposal management is about writing a winning proposal that will wow the federal buyers and make them want to award the contract to you, right? Um, capture management, what we're going to be talking about today, is vital for small businesses in the federal market for your success. In this training, I'm going to teach you three skills that every great capture manager must have. Um, and great, when I say it, great means that your company is going to start winning more contracts because you're executing these skills in the way that um, I teach you and that you practice to get better and better at. So you're going to start winning more contracts uh, in federal agencies. I want you to keep in mind also that I say capture management, capture manager, uh, but that's if your job title is something else, it doesn't matter. That's totally fine because we're going to have a lot of different titles. Uh, you might be the owner of the small business out there um, or you know different roles. I know in small businesses, we all wear many hats. And so capture management is more about a skill set than it is about a job title. Uh, but the skills are vital to anybody responsible for um, influencing or winning more business for your company, to bring more revenue into your company. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I'm the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. I wanna welcome you to my federal sales training where I teach tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years as a small business owner in the federal market. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. When the process is followed A to Z, you're gonna have predictable, repeatable results. Before we get started, do me a favor, help buyers remember who you are in the chat. Put your company name and two or three words that describe your core competency, your product or services that you sell. Don't put a lot in, two or three words. If you put a lot in, I don't mind. I'll, I'll just kind of screw, go past it, but I will not look at it. And I don't mean it in a mean way, but I mean when I look down and I see Carol Yard, for example, um, Smooth Swing Enterprise, business development manager, I'm looking at these things trying to go, okay, what do people do? Here's Annette, right? Nelson Enterprise Technology Services, IT Network and Help Desk. I'm like, okay, that's starting to sink in. Now, Annette, I need to see it like 20 more times for it to sink in. But that, so when I say don't put a lot there, I just mean we don't read anymore. And so you need to get us um, in the in the amount of time I have to, to look at that. I have a short attention span, so does everybody. Um, you wanna be able to drive home the basic key three, two or three words about what your company does. Um, if you haven't done so already, do me a favor, download the, um, directories that we offer on the on our on our website, you should be able to see them here. The federal directories are the small business specialist. It has over a thousand names, numbers, and emails of uh, federal buyers and large prime SBLOs. The federal oh, and when I said seven mentors earlier, by the way, their name, numbers, and emails are in here as well. Um, the federal directory for long range acquisition forecast. This is over a hundred um, a hundred links to federal agency long range acquisition forecast. This is where you can find opportunities that potentially fit your pipeline. And then the vendor supplier portal, be where the um, buyers are looking. These DSBS, the Dynamic Small Business Search, is the number one market research tool for the federal buyer. But many agencies have their own portals and certainly the large primes have their own uh, supplier or vendor portal. And so you want to be registered in the agencies and the large primes that you want to sell to. So take a look at that. Uh, you can download that off our website. And finally, I wanted to say thank you to the GovCon Chamber of Commerce sustaining members. We don't take any federal dollars and we don't take any money from large primes sponsoring us. Uh, sustaining members like you are the ones who make this possible. And I really wanna say thank you because um, through your generosity, we're able to keep bringing this back day after day for you and for others. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and dive into what makes capture managers great in the federal market. Actually, uh, before I go too far, I wanted to tell you a story about why I come back every single day to provide training to small businesses in the federal market, it's because I want you to win more contracts. Um, I got a call this morning from a small business who's you know part of our community, and she's telling me this story about how she wrote four proposals in January based on my recommendations, and won two of them already, and the other two are pending. Right? Super great news. And she took um, to heart my recommendation to all of you, which is that you should be writing four proposals every single month. And there's a whole training on that in the numbers, but basically. Um, if you can't prime, just go get on four teams. But if you do this, now you're playing the numbers game and you're doing enough activity and action that will lead to your success. For me, this was so great to hear from her 
Um, and it's a great way to start my day off, right? But what I really liked is that she's coming and getting the knowledge from me and then through the activity is developing those skills that she should have to be a, a great at capture management, um, in this case, proposals as well, but a, a great at federal government sales. You get the knowledge from me and I tell you how to move forward, right? So when I teach you about capture today, um, it's the same thing. I'm gonna give you the knowledge on how to do this skill, how to develop it, right? But the activity comes from you. Everyone else will tell you what to do. We tell you how to do what must be done. And that's what today's training is about as well. But I was super excited to hear that because um, really success in the federal market is a, it comes down to a numbers game. There's skills on it, but it really comes down to a numbers game. Because if you have knowledge and skills, but you don't do activity, you're not gonna have success. Um, okay, so on to capture. Three main things I'm gonna cover um, in today's training. Um, really talking about uh, the three top skills for capture managers are around starting and building relationships, um, shaping opportunities, and actually using project management type skills to do, to your, do your day to day job. So let me just start with um, uh, build, starting and building relationships, right? So great federal capture managers, great people who are, are people who are great at capture management, they can start and build relationships from scratch. They can go into any agency and build new relationships. It's not enough to have old relationships. I've talked about this in the past, that if you're a, a, a business owner or somebody's responsible for hiring salespeople, never hire them based on who they know, right? That should just be something they're bringing in. Hiring, hire them based on what they can do. So if somebody has a lot of uh, contacts from uh, the, the uh, you know, HHS, they say, hey, I, I've been in HHS for a while, 10 plus years. I have a Rolodex, a group of names of 100 people, 1,000 people, whatever. It's like, well, that's fine. Can you find 101? Can you find 1,001? Can you find contacts and, and start and build relationships over in the Army? That's what you want from somebody you hire. And if you're a person doing capture management, this is what we expect of you. And this is what will make you great is your ability to start and build relationships. And it has nothing to do with charisma. It has nothing to do with chemistry or, hey, you know, we're, we're connecting, we're talking. It has to do with your ability to follow a process for starting and building relationships. In the business world, relationships tend to be a lot more about uh, with them. What's in it for me? Does it make sense for us to build a relationship together? Then do I like your hairstyle or do I like how we're talking to each other or something? And so it's a process. The reason I'm saying that is just to remind you that um, building relationships is a process. And so when I give you the knowledge and I give you the, and I teach you how to develop the skills for starting and building relationships, then you will be able to do this over and over again in any agency um, out there. So let's talk about the type of relationships you should expect to be able to build as a great capture manager. Um, you should be able to go into any agency and develop relationships with, uh, in kind of order of toughness, if you will, um, small business specialists. These are the advocates liaisons within an agency for you. So you want to be able to build relationships. Every good capture manager has a small business specialist tied to every one of their opportunities. They know who the small business specialist is to copy on all their emails to like the contracting officer or to the program office. They never leave that small business specialist out of the loop. Most importantly, they, they engage them to learn from them. Going up from there, you have the contracting officers. Um, this might be a contracting officer or a contract specialist. They're, they're a team, right? Um, but you want to be able to develop relationships with these people, start and build relationships with these folks. And you'll be able to, and I'll talk more about what you can do with them, but you'll be able to um, have conversations and shape the opportunity, which is the next bullet I'll talk about. Um, I have a lot of separate training out there that you can find that's around um, how to start and build relationships. I've done over, I think I'm over 250 videos in the last 12 months of live federal sales training. And I would bet that 50% of them are on how to basically start and build relationships. One way or another, I'm coming at it from many different angles because that's what um, people have a, the biggest challenge with. Uh, agency buyers, continuing down, the third one and the last one is the program office. You wanna be able to meet people within the program office who can um, share information with, the, with you, that you can share information with them. And so this one's the toughest one, right? But this is the one that makes you worth your money. If you can sit there and identify the program office, if you can then identify people working in the program office, if you can then get in and start and build relationships and starting and building relationships, by the way, begin with outreach. If you follow our seven step process, it's research, it's targeting, it's outreach. Uh, actually just because I haven't shown it in a while, 
let me just make sure people who might be new, this is the seven step process, right? For federal success, um, federal revenue success. You research an agency you're going into, you're targeting, this is finding the names, numbers, and emails, and then you're doing outreach. And this is the start and building relationships. Because once you have started it, theoretically you maintain the relationship, right? But sales comes from people's ability to start and build those relationships. Um, okay, so let's talk about competitors. Another group that you want to be building relationships with um, and what your company needs you uh, to be able to do is to start and build relationships with large government contractors and small government contractors. So as they look into, um, as you're looking at an opportunity, right? Because we're talking about um, great federal capture related to an opportunity and we're trying to drive an opportunity forward, that requires teaming. I talked about this yesterday in previous training. If you go look at that, but, um, but I've talked about the value of teaming and how to go build teams. Well, so when you're starting and building relationships, make sure you know how to actually start and build relationships with large and small businesses and, and know how to look across the board and see which relationships I should be starting. So a large, um, I might be looking for a large that's in a sub, I mean, excuse me, in an agency or in a contract vehicle. I might look for a similar thing with smalls, but I also might look for socioeconomic status by um, looking and building relationships with companies that are maybe SDBOs, if I'm an SDBO, because then I can do similarly situated entities uh, type, you know, that's teaming and you can learn more about that separately, but you wanna build these relationships. And so that's a vital skill for um, small businesses to have. Put Build new relationships if you understand that in order to be a great capture manager, you must be able to start and build relationships. And let me leave you with one tip as you're doing this on how to start and build a relationship. Download the small business specialist directory I just uh, told you about a minute ago, right? It's on our site, www.govconchamber.com. Go there, download the small business directory. It's free. It's um, immeasurably valuable or very valuable. However, I say that, right? Um, but it has in their names of small business liaisons for larges, or it has in there a lot of names for agencies that you might be going after. Pick one and try to go develop a relationship. And the way you develop the relationship with them is have an introduction meeting, right? I'm not going to talk to you too much about getting in there because I think most of us do fine when we're in. There's the part we struggle on is how do you get in the door? So pick a name out of the small business directory that aligns to your agency and then just call them. Pick up the phone and call them and say, I'd like to schedule an introduction meeting. When you schedule an introduction meeting, you can bring your capability statement and quickly do an intro. Hey, 15, 30 minutes max. I want to introduce my company. I want to little, learn a little bit more about yours, right? So you call them. If you have to leave a voicemail, do that. Follow up with an email. I have a um, handout that I lay out in a training that talks about how do you follow up for 30 days to find to reach somebody who hasn't got back to you. But this is how you can start that relationship and begin to build it. You're building it um, following that first meeting. Okay, so let's talk about the second thing. The second greatest thing about a uh, capture manager's the skill that you must have um, is you must be able to shape an opportunity. This is foundational, right? Uh, starting and building relationships, shaping an opportunity. Fundamentally, um, shaping an opportunity is the biggest activity you will do on uh, any opportunity that will be valuable to your company. And let me tell you why it's really important to shape opportunities. Um, the first reason, and I think the biggest reason, is that when you shape an opportunity, you're able to reduce the com competition, virtually eliminate hundreds of thousands of small business or businesses from competing on your opportunity. Let me give you an example. If you have an opportunity and you're trying to go after it and you're doing capture and you're trying to shape an opportunity, you can go in and try to push how to do that is later, but you can go in to push for it to be a hub zone set aside um, opportunity. If you're a hub zone firm, if you do that, you will reduce the competition by like 99%. Right now in SAM, there's basically 400,000 firms that say they want to sell to the government. Rough numbers, but 400,000. There's 4,000 um, hub zone firms, basically. So you're going from 400,000 to 4,000. You just eliminated 99% of the competition. That's a great reason for shaping an opportunity. Another reason for shaping an opportunity that's really valuable is that it increases um, the strength of your company proposal. If you can get in and shape the opportunity, which I'll talk about how to do that in a second, if you can shape an opportunity as a capture manager or doing capture management um, tasks, if you can shape the opportunity, you will increase the likelihood of, the, of your proposal winning. So the strength of your proposal. Um, I have a whole training on what I call the winning proposal score. And the max score is 100. And it talks about 
how do you, what can you do? What are the tasks you can do to work up to a hundred? And when you're doing these tasks, you're shaping the opportunity to this strong proposal, this winning proposal that'll go out there. And, and that obviously leads to my third point about why is it important to shape an opportunity? It's because you're going to increase your chances of winning. If you don't shape an opportunity, somebody else is, your competition is. And so they're shaping it a little bit towards their direction instead of your direction, right? And so you want to get in there and shape the opportunity. There's two main areas that you will shape an opportunity in the federal market. Uh, one is technical requirements and the other is the acquisition approach. These are the uh, two areas that I break down. <clears throat> and so technical requirements tend to be more about the scope and focus on the program office's concerns. Um, so in this case, um, one of the ways, and I'm going to give you three ways you can shape the technical requirements. One way is to push for features that are unique to you. Push for features that maybe your company or your product, your services, your approach have that maybe your competition doesn't. I'll give you an example. When I had my last company, um, there was I, I did Microsoft SharePoint services fundamentally. And there was a couple of um, third party tools, really big tools, but third party tools. And I was partnered with one of them. It's AppPoint um, and Quest were these two tools back then. And so I was I had a really good partnership with AppPoint. And so what I did when I went in to influence whether the government was looking at Quest or an AppPoint is I highlighted the AppPoint features. Um, I went in and said, look, you want to make sure that um, it has DOD 5015 compliance, I think, to records management, things like that. But um, if I can begin to insert some of the language and features that are in AppPoint into the requirements, now when the requirement comes out, Quest is not really going to be an option because I've been able to insert uh, these other lines. And I'm not doing it uh, secretively or something. I'm having a conversation with the customer. I'm shaping that opportunity by telling them why this uh, why this feature or this thing is so important for them to include. Uh, that's unique to us, fortunately, right? There's a benefit there, but it's, it's very valuable to them. An example is what I just said, this DOD 5015.2, I think I'm saying it right for the old records management thing. Um, but what it was saying was that AvPoint's product was basically approved by DOD for DOD systems, but Quest was not. And so on a civilian side, I would say, hey, you want to put this in because DOD did all this vetting. Now you don't have to worry about wondering whether the, that Quest tool or any other third party tool will not fit up to the, the max. Um, no offense to Quest because I liked Quest. Um, I love AvPoint. Um, OK, second reason, second reason for uh, technical requirements is that you can add in or remove uh, key personnel or descriptions of key personnel activity or skill sets. And so I often see larger proposals. I tend to play in the proposals that are 10 to $250 million range. And so when you have opportunities like that, there's a lot more likelihood you tend to see key personnel. I actually just saw an opportunity that was 2 million. It had three key personnel in there. It's too late when the RFP comes out and they're talking about, hey, here's the key personnel. But I actually saw these three key personnel and they didn't make any sense to me to the project. Uh, an example is they were asking for a, uh, this was a SharePoint project, but they were asking for a SharePoint developer, a share, a trainer, I don't even know if they said SharePoint trainer, and a project manager. And if I had gone back there to influence this or influence them, I would have said, get rid of uh, two of them. Just make sure that you bring in, um, if it's three people are gonna be on the contract, they all must be SharePoint experts and they all uh, must be capable of providing training and uh, the team collectively must manage the project. But with three people, I don't need a dedicated project manager. You're wasting your money by paying me to have a project manager basically sit by. It's better for you to have me have three people who can do SharePoint. And so you want to go in and, and add in some of these personnel or weave them out. And one more thing related to those key personnel is the certifications they have. If I have people who are highly certified, then Capture is about going in and convincing the program office that you want these people to be certified. Let's just stay with Microsoft, for example. For um, example, You want these people to be Microsoft certified developers. That means Microsoft has put a seal of approval on there. And these people have a tight relationship with Microsoft. that would be really valuable to your project as you go forward, right? You're, you're trying to convince them that, yes, that's a requirement of ours. Um, anybody can work on the project as long as they're certified Microsoft developers. When you do that, now you're, you're, able to push it more to your strengths because you have a lot of those developers. The third one, last one is um, on the technical requirements. You can be talking to the program office, trying to talk to them about shaping the um, organizational certifications, CMMI, ISO, right? It's one thing for the uh, contracting office to say this, 
but it's the program management or program office. You want to get in there and say, hey, it's really important that you make this CMMI level three, which is a software development type certification, right? And level three is really high. There's not many people at that level. Or if you don't have level three, you want to go, hey, that's unnecessary. You just want it to be level two. Or really, you don't need any because this really doesn't apply to that certification. Or you're going to increase the cost of the project because of that. However, you make your case to, to insert it or to pull it out, it doesn't matter at the moment. The point of shaping technical requirements is to get something put in or to take something out that will be to your advantage. Um, the other way of shaping an opportunity is the acquisition approach. And so acquisition approach, you can shape things like what contract vehicle it's going to be on. The way you do this, by the way, is just through conversations. There's no magic to it. You want to have conversations with the contracting officer and try to begin to get them to see this contract vehicle instead of that. For example, if you're on 8A Stars 3, you need to be getting in and talking to your agency contracting officers about the 8A Stars 3 contract vehicle. No one can use that contract vehicle unless they've had a delegation of procurement authority or something, some training that they have to get. They have to get an approval to use this vehicle. Well, you need to be in there not only... Um, making sure they have that, but then convincing them that, hey, this is a better vehicle. You're still going to have a lot of competition out here. So you're, you're not doing direct award or anything. It's still a thousand people on that vehicle. But if you can get it on there, now you're getting it onto a vehicle that you're on. The earlier you can get into an opportunity shaping it during capture, the more likelihood uh, that you'll have to be able to shape it to the opportunity you want. Um, FAR clauses is another example, and I'm not going to go too far because I'm running out of time. But there's one FAR clause that's one of my favorite is the hub zone price preference. Basically, what it means is if you're um, if the opportunity is full and open and they put a hub zone price preference in there, when two, um, let's say a large and a hub zone have their, uh, these are the two they're considering finally or something. Well, the hub zone gets this 10% price preference. So if they're both a million dollar contract, uh, the hub zones is now 900,000 or the other one goes up by 10%. But either way, it gives it that price preference for a hub zone. If you're a hub zone firm and you're seeing a, uh, set aside, then you, you can go in and try to get the contracting officer to insert that in. I don't know why that's actually not in every single full and open contract. It shouldn't even be an option um, if you really care government about going to hub zones. Um, and then the last one is an example is the NAICS code. So NAICS code might seem kind of simple, but if you can shape the NAICS code, right, get them to look at a different NAICS code than maybe what they were considering, you would go with the lowest possible NAICS. And what I mean by lowest is the NAICS codes have a certain dollar value that says you're no longer small. And so there's small businesses that on this NAICS, they might be large. And so it's a way for you to push competition out. So if you're a very beginning company under 10 million or something, then you can go in and push for very small NAICS codes if it fits in, right? I'm not saying it's gonna work every time, but that's an example of how you can shape the opportunity. Put shape the opportunity into the chat. Let me know you're tracking on that. Um, I'm running out of time here. So I'm gonna go pretty fast on this last one about um, project management skills, but great federal uh, capture managers use project management skills. They don't dismiss it. Um, they understand and use these project skills in their day-to-day -day activity. And let me tell you why. First off, you can't operate in a vacuum. Leadership and everybody else, they need to be informed. Project management skills are kind of basically about documenting and communicating what's going on. Um, no one's looking for you to be a firefighter. They don't want heroes. They want fire prevention folks. Right. And so when they look at capture management, we don't want you to bring a win out of left field. We want you to have predictable winning happening through your pipeline. And that happens when you start documenting. You don't have to document a ton. I'm a uh, anti-administration burden kind of a guy, but you still want to do that. And the last one is they want to make sure no one's dropping balls. And when you um, and so if you're juggling and you drop a ball, uh, that's not bad. But when you have opportunities and you're juggling opportunities or relationships and you drop one, these relationships, these opportunities, are made of glass and they're going to shatter. And so we want to make sure you don't drop any balls by using some basic project management skills. You'll be able to maintain the order there. And so quick examples of project management skills you can use um, in the meetings and then in the pipeline. So first off in the meetings, um, plan for successful, not great meetings. You don't want to go in and just say, I'm going to have a great meeting. Everybody loved each other. You want a successful meeting and that means the sale moved forward. I have a whole separate training just on that one topic. Um, you want to use uh, the right tools. So example, before you go into a meeting, you want to use call plan sheets that say what's your objective and what are your questions that you want to ask in that meeting. And you want to have a teaming worksheet that allows you to track the teaming partners you're going after. Again, whole separate trainings on each of those topics. Um, and then the last one on, on meetings is you want to make sure you're tracking action items. 
This is really important, your action items and theirs, to make sure they're getting done. Because when action items are getting done, first off, it helps build the relationship, but also it helps move the sale forward. In the pipeline, some uh, quick bullets here is that you want to make sure you're updating the pipeline with notes. If you have a meeting and there's something that comes out of it, put it into the pipeline. You don't need paragraphs, right? A couple of bullets to say, I learned this, this, and this. Um, you want to break down in the pipeline this big opportunity you're trying to win. Break it down into smaller tasks. I talked about this in a previous training as well, but two to four hour tasks. If you do that, you will see your progress moving forward uh, as you go in. And then um, the last one is follow a defined process. And this just means make sure you're moving forward on opportunities the same way every single time. All right, so put proactive, be proactive into the chat if you're tracking that, because all that project management activity means you're being proactive. Um, just a quick recap as we go forward on what makes a great capture manager. They uh, can easily start and build relationships. They can shape opportunities that increase the chances of winning and they use basic project management skills on a day-to-day, -day, um, in their day-to-day -day job. And I'm hoping these are three skills that you have or are developing. And my tip for you as you move forward is look at these skills, determine which one's your weakest and work on it for the next 30 days. Um, I have slides that I use on this. It's available to uh, the sustaining members in the library as we put it in there. Um, the replay though is available to everybody. Remember, government contracting, it is not a secret. It's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.